So today we're going to talk about two-term homogeneous linear recurrence relations with constant coefficients. Now, that's a really wordy statement. So what I mean here is you have a sequence like T1, T2, up to et cetera, Tn, et cetera, and it satisfies a recursive equation. The nth term is some constant times the previous term plus another constant times the term before that, no matter what term in the sequence you're looking for. So for example, the Fibonacci sequence satisfies this. The nth term is the sum of the previous two terms. So A and B would be one here. And so the question we're going to ask is how do you develop an actual formula explicitly in terms of n for something like this? And the theorem we're going to show and see an example of is that you can actually figure out what the terms will look like in terms of n straight from these coefficients a and b themselves. So if we have a sequence like this and it satisfies a recurrence relation, and that holds for all n greater than or equal to 3, so you have some base cases when n is 2 or 1, then um, if we do the following setup, we'll let alpha, or sorry, r and s, the roots of a specific quadratic, that we get from these coefficients is going to be x squared minus ax minus b. Um, and then, and first of all, we should mention these are not necessarily distinct. So you could have a repeated root here. Then, if the two roots are the same, I'm sorry, if they're different, there are constants alpha and beta so that the nth term will look like alpha times one of the roots to the n plus beta times one of the roots to the n. So this nth term will be the sum of scaled versions of exponentials that are governed by the roots of this polynomial right over here. Now, if it's the case that r and s are the same, then it looks like this would collapse into one term, but it turns out that this looks slightly different and you'll have that t sub n is alpha plus beta n for some constants alpha and beta times r to the n. And notice here r and s are the same, so we could repeat replace this by um, s instead of r. So what I want to do now is look at an example of actually using this consequence. And then we're going to actually prove why that's the case. And that's the advantage of this video. A lot of videos that talk about recursive equations and the solutions for them don't actually talk about why these solutions in general work. So we're going to actually cover that in this video. Okay, so let's go and look at an example first. So in our first example, we're going to say t1 is 2, t2 is 7. And uh, let's say for all n greater than or equal to 3, we have a recursive equation that looks something like this. tn is twice tn minus 1 plus 3 times tn minus 2. Okay, so what's the nth term going to look like? So first, we have to consider the quadratic um, where we set 2 to be a, 3 to be b, and it's the quadratic x squared minus ax minus b. So the roots of x squared minus 2x minus 3 are, I think the roots are going to be 3 and negative 1, uh, because this thing factors into x plus 3 and x minus 1. So by the theorem, there should be constants alpha and beta such that the nth term in general is going to look like alpha times r to the n plus beta times s to the n, where r and s are the roots that we got, which were negative th uh, 3 and negative 1. So we'll replace them here. We'll have 3 to the n and negative 1 to the n. Okay, so it seems like, at least right now, that this doesn't actually give you the solutions that you, the actual explicit solution that you want. But you have this, this initial uh, set of conditions that t1 is 2 and t2 is 7, so we can use that to our advantage. 
right? So since t1 is 2, if we plug that into this equation, we have uh, 2 equals 3 times alpha plus negative 1 times beta. Okay, and then since t2 is 7, 7 equals 3, uh, 3 squared times alpha plus negative 1 squared times beta. And so now what we can do to figure out what these alpha and beta are is we can solve this system of equations for alpha and beta right here. And what's going to happen in general if we're trying to prove that we can actually uh, solve for alpha and beta and get explicit solution in our general case is we'll have this system and we'll need to justify that we can actually find alpha and beta by looking at the coefficients of this particular system. In this particular case, you can uh, see that because negative 1 and 1 add to 0, if we add the two equations, we'll be able to isolate for alpha. So we'll get 9 equals uh, 3 plus 3 squared, that's 3 plus 9, so it's 12 alpha. And so alpha is 3 fourths. Okay, you can back substitute, and uh, I will just compute this. You actually end up with beta being a fourth. And so your general term then is going to be uh, 3 fourths times 3 to the n plus 1 fourth times negative 1 to the n. You can actually check this works. So uh, one thing you can do is plug this expression in here and see that when you collect terms, you actually get the t sub n term just to make sure this is actually correct. Okay, so now we'll move on to the actual proof of this theorem. And we're going to prove just the first part when the two roots are different. And the proof when the two roots are the same, so this should say that r and s are equal, is actually very similar. Uh, and so that's something you can actually give a try. Try to see how we can adjust the proof for this first part to get the proof for the second part. Okay, so let's go ahead and do the second part. So again, our setup, suppose we have a sequence. It satisfies this recurrence relation with these constants a and b. Then if we write down this quadratic, x squared minus ax minus b, if r and s are different, then there are alpha and beta, so that the nth term looks exactly like this. Uh, okay, so first, we make the assumption um, that b is not equal to 0. Actually, it doesn't even need to be an assumption. Um, we'll say b is not equal to 0, um, so none of the roots of this are going to be 0 themselves. Now, you might think, why would you do that? Um, so if it happened to be the case that b was 0, then you would get a recurrence relation that looked like tn is a multiple of tn minus 1. But we can actually explicitly find out what tn would be in that case. Every term is a times the previous term. So if you keep iterating, you'll get that the nth term is a to the exponent n times t0, or a to the n minus 1 times t1. So we can make that assumption that b is non-zero pretty uh, manageably. And the only way to get this thing to have a root of zero is if this term was zero. So making the assumption that this is zero gives us that the roots r and s to this particular quadratic are non-zero. Okay, so the question is, how do we actually figure out these constants, alpha and beta, so that tn looks like this. So the way we did this is we looked at the first and second terms and then isolated. So we said select alpha and beta so that t1 is alpha times r plus beta times s and t2 is alpha times r squared plus beta times s squared. Now the question is, how do you actually know that you're able to find solutions for alpha and beta to this particular system of equations? Well, we can write in gray what this system of equations actually looks like. 
if we write it in vector form, it's going to look like T1, T2 equals the matrix alpha, beta, or actually, the matrix R, S, R squared, S squared, times the vector alpha, beta. Okay, so we'll get a solution for alpha and beta to this system of equations, provided that this thing has an inverse. Or in other words, the determinant of this matrix is non-zero. And we can verify that that's the case. So this has a solution for alpha and beta because, if we call this matrix A, the determinant of A is R times S squared minus S times R squared, which is Rs times R minus S, and this is not zero. If the determinant of A is non-zero, that means it's invertible. So A is invertible. And we can solve the system. Now, why is it the case that this quantity is non-zero? Well, from our valid assumption that B is not zero, we got that both R and S are non-zero. And in this situation, we have that R and S are different roots, so this quantity is non-zero as well. Okay, so if we pick alpha and beta this way, uh, we're making the assumptions that it must be the case that uh, this particular expression, Tn being alpha r to the n plus beta s to the n, holds for all n. We can actually prove this inductively. So notice the proposed formula holds for n equals 1 and 2. That's actually exactly what we have right over here, sort of designed to hold for, um, for them. Um, so now assume it's true for all n, or for all indices less than n, meaning that this formula holds for t1, t2, everything except uh, up to t sub n minus 1. Now we want to verify that it actually holds for tn. So we can look at the recursive formula to get that fact. We'll get then tn. The definition we have for tn is that it's a times tn minus 1 plus b times tn minus 2. Okay, um, now by induction, this is alpha r to the n minus 1 plus beta s to the n minus 1, and then plus b times alpha r to the n minus 2 plus beta and r or s to the n minus 2. So now we want to collect all of these pieces together to be able to figure out what to do. So what we're going to do is get rid of some of this stuff before, and then we will see how to continue. Okay, so now with this setup, we'll collect all the pieces that involve alpha and factor out as much as possible. So we notice there's an a alpha r to the n minus 1 and a b alpha r to the n minus 2. So what we'll do is take out an alpha times r to the n minus 2. And that leaves us with uh, a times r plus b. And similarly, we'll take out an a beta s to the n minus 1, or n minus 2, and we'll get uh, a times s plus b. Okay, but r and s are roots of a particular equation or particular quadratic is the x1 given by x squared minus ax minus b. So that means that this expression, if you set this to 0, x squared 
equals ax plus b for each one of these roots. So these two quantities can be replaced by r squared and s squared respectively. And that gives us alpha r to the n plus beta s to the n, which is exactly the thing that we wanted. So an actual cool proof to see that it is definitely the case that this general form for a recursive equation does work.